Well, here we are, the last of a nine-part series for there are nine aspects of the one fruit of the Spirit. That's so important. <clears throat> it's not like we should just have one of these represented in our lives. They should all be represented in our lives. Because when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you receive the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the one who produces all these qualities. Now, the one of the qualities I want to talk today it was saved for last, but it's a really important one. It's called self-control. And so the question is, <clears throat> what is self-control? Well, I'm going to give a, a short uh, answer to that. And uh, there, don't you wish everybody had one of those on their forehead? You could just turn them on or turn them off. Uh, this is just getting a little too much for me. I'll just turn myself off for a moment and settle down. No, <clears throat> self-control is that virtue of mastering your desires and your passions, especially the sensual ones, you know, those appetites that, that we have. All of our appetites are good, okay? It's good to have an appetite and be hungry, but gluttony is not a good thing. It's good, <coughs> excuse, <coughs> excuse me, to have <coughs> a thirst. <coughs> I might have one right now. <coughs> it's good to have that, have a thirst, but is something else about being drunk, okay? And so all of our, our appetites are good, but it's having control over them that is important. And, and that's what the, this fruit of the Spirit is about. So where is it needed today? Well, I've already suggested that uh, there's a food appetite and the dieter needs self-control. Anybody agree with that? Only one hand went up? The rest of you don't believe you need self-control? Oh, yeah, Okay. <laughs> Yeah, have you ever done a, a, a diet and said, well, I'm not going to have any self-control? Yeah, that's called that seafood diet, seafood, eat food. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what happens. You have to have self-control. Well, well, who else? Well, the alcohol appetite is, you, you, you need self-control if you're an alcoholic. I mean, you've got to have that. The getting high appetite is needed for the addict. Right? The thrill appetite for the gambler. I knew a man who made a really, really great salary and blew it all on the horse races. Died penniless because he could not control, get self control. It was always, I'm going to be a winner on the next one. The next one's going to be the big one. The next one. You need self control. We need to control that appetite for the thrill of winning. The deceptive appetite. There's some people that just cannot tell the truth. Do you ever notice that? I mean, it is glaring. It's just glaring. And I said to a young man one day, I said, oh, you must have stepped out for a smoke. I mean, he's just reeking with smoke. And he said to him, no, I didn't, uh-uh. <laughs> okay, you just can't tell the truth, okay? That, that, that happens, okay? The material appetite, where I want things for the covetous. You know, the Apostle Paul himself said, you know, of all the Ten Commandments, he said, hey, I did really well until we got to that tenth one, thou shalt not covet. Because all the other are just external things. You just stop doing them. That one is about your heart. I covet and I want, I want. And he said, to get self-control on that was a tough one, a tough one. The talk appetite, that's a tough one for the gossip. Get self-control on the tongue. You know, James said if you can control your tongue, you can control your whole body. You know, get self-control there. Then there's a sexual appetite. And I just put down there, for everyone. We live in a generation that is bombarded with sex. You turn on the evening TV, I don't care what channel you're on, sooner or later it's going to pop in there. They try to sell with sex. It's all about sex. And, and it's a false love, the sexual appetite. You, you know, the stuff that's on TV today, 50 years ago, would have been considered pornographic. Am I right? Yeah, 50 years ago, what's on TV today would be considered pornographic. And yet, because we can't find anything else, well, then we're forced to watch it. No, we're not. You see, that's where self-control can step in. I can do something better with my time than that. I want to focus on that last one for a moment. It says, now the matters you wrote about. It's good for a man not to marry. 
Oh, most people uh, don't want to believe that verse. Everybody thinks that marriage is going to solve all my problems. The honest truth is, it doubles them. <laughs> all right? <laughs> Let's just get honest here. So, so what's Paul say? He said, hey, now for the matters you wrote about, it's good for a man not to marry. Obviously, they had some questions about marriage. He said, don't marry and everything will be fine. But since there is so much immorality, he must have been living in our generation. Huh? Well, Rome was pagan, all right? Rome was pagan. Corinth took paganism to the max, all right? And they had so-called temple vir virgins in the ancient world, which were not virgins at all, okay? They were there for your pleasure. Listen, he's saying, so since there's so much immorality in the world, each man, I like that, each man should have his own wife. That's really important. The Bible doesn't say each man should have his own husband. Did you get that? It's not the way it works. When God, who, who created the institution of marriage between a man and a woman, he says, and part of it is, so there's no immorality if you just get your own wife. Now, I have my own wife, and I call her my wife. And she's nobody else's wife. She's mine. I'm very possessive, all right? And so don't go messing with my wife. Go mess with your own, you see? A very, very possessive thing here. But notice what it Each man should have his own wife, and he says each woman should have her own husband. It's possessive. He's mine. Go get your own. Leave my man alone. You see what's going on here? And this is to curb immorality. It goes deeper than that. It's all about self-control, self-control. The husband should fulfill his marital duty. Okay, the marital duty is an obligation. An obligation is to satisfy his wife. Now, in the context, this is about sexually satisfy your wife, all right? And so, and likewise, it says to her husband, the wife to the husband. Listen, there's, when you get married, you have an obligation to meet your spouse's needs sexually so they don't commit immorality. That's it. The wife's body does not belong to her alone. Yeah, it's hers, but it's mine too. All right? That's the one that's my wife, not your wife. No one else's wife, just my wife. And he says also, in the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but for the wife. And, and so uh, we have each other. And that's the whole point. That's what marriage is about. A man and a woman fully devoted to each other to have the most beautiful union in love. That's what it's about. So that you are not drawn away somewhere else. Now here comes the command of the whole thing. He's been talking about it. Now here's the command. Do not deprive each other. You know the old thing, oh, I got a headache tonight. Doesn't float here. In fact, actually, the marital act relieves tension. It might just solve your headache. Do not deprive each other, the text says. Except, there's an exception. By mutual consent, they both agree for a designated time so that you may devote yourself instead to prayer. To prayer. Years ago, my son, Liam's dad, was out pulling pranks with his buddy. They jump out of the car, run and knock down a snowman. You know? Well, he ran into one that was iced over. It didn't budge. <laughs> Boom! In fact, instead of the snowman going over, he flopped on the ground. We were going to the basketball game. I caught up with him at the college basketball game and said, Jonathan, you're not looking very good. He said, oh, no, Dad, I'm not feeling good. I said, at, by the time the game was about half, halfway through the game, he said, Dad, I'm really not feeling good. So I took him out and I just took him to the hospital. Make a long story short, he had a ruptured spleen. I had to remove his spleen from running into that. Well, you know, that night, the only thing on my mind and my wife's mind was praying for our son. Does that make sense? There, there's a time when, when you, you, 
You let go of having your own need, even sexual need, satisfied so that you may focus on something else of greater value that you're both agreed on. And we prayed, we prayed, and we prayed. And God brought our child through. Listen, he says, but don't deprive each other. And then he said, but if you've taken that time out for a focus on prayer, he says, then come together. It's a command. God expects married people to perform the act of marriage. That's just that, that's that simple. That's where the passage started from. If you don't be immoral, do it morally. Get married. <laughs> just get married. He says, come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of what? Self-control. See, God knows the stuff we're made of. He knows that I have passions, passions for food, passion for drink, a passion for a thrill. That's why I go to Cedar Point and I ride the rides. He knows I have these passions, and he's saying, but you have to have self-control, and since you lack it, I give you the Holy Spirit. And when you rely on the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will provide the self-control that you need in, in whatever that passion arises in your life. He says... Uh, you can also help somebody else. You don't put temptation in their way. In fact, you don't become Satan's accomplice by withholding what your spouse needs in order for them to live a pure and godly life. This command. Now, he says this. I'm going right down through this Corinthians passage. I say as a concession, not as a command. He said, what I'm about to say is, is a concession. Uh, I don't have a direct command from the Lord on this. But he does believe later, he says, that I have the Holy Spirit, so I, I, what I'm selling is true. I wish that all men were as I am. How is Paul? Paul is a self-controlled single man. He said, I wish you were all like me. Self-controlled, single man. But each man has his own gift from God. Some people have the gift of singleness. I don't, okay? <laughs> That's why I got married. I don't have the gift of singleness. Paul had the gift of singleness. And he says, one has this gift, another has the gift for marriage. In fact, uh, just before I met Diane, I uh, told the elders at the church at an elders meeting, I said, you know what? I think, I, I really believe I don't have the gift of singleness. I really would like a godly woman in my life. And I, w I would just like you guys to pray that God would bring someone into my life. That I said, Guys, I've looked at all the women here at church that are single, and she's not here. And so, so they prayed. <laughs> they stopped the meeting, and they prayed. That very week, I met Diane. All right? And so I was praying because I didn't believe I had this gift of singleness. I, and I wanted to be able to, you know, I, I, I don't want to lose self-control. Listen, the point is it's not a command to get married if you are self-controlled. But it is a command if you are not self-controlled. You better find yourself a spouse. He says, now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is not good for them to stay unmarried as I am, but if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Our text has added the word with passion. It's really just better to marry than to burn. Something that's even stronger than just burn with passion is better to marry than to burn you know where. Hmm. This is pretty serious stuff. It's needed more now than ever, self-control. Listen to text says. Go to Timothy now. Mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. Do you believe we're in the last days? I believe we're in the last days. I, I mean, just look what's going on in our world. Are we in the last days? It sure seems like we're in the last days. There will be terrible times in the last days. Watch what happens. People will be lovers of themselves. Is that true? Yeah, people love themselves. They put themselves first in front of everybody. Every athlete, I'm number one. <laughs> Where's the humility? All right. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. It's interesting. I ask young people what they want to do when they grow up, and I get more and more this. I want to get, make a lot of money and be rich. It's no longer a career. A love of money. They're boastful. They're proud. Abusive. Disobedient to their parents. Ungrateful. 
unholy. The word holy means special. They don't see anything special about anything. Everything is just common, and they just use it and throw it away. They're without love, unforgiving, slanderous. Here it is, without self-control. It's times in which we live. People have no self-control. In the book of Judges, it says two times, there was no king in Israel in those days, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. He did whatever he wanted. There was no king, no restraint, no one putting control on them. So they did whatever they want. And if you read the book of Judges, you see that are terrible, terrible, wicked times, just like the times we live in. Without self-control, they're brutal, not lovers of the good. Today they call evil good and good evil. I do think we are in these last times. They're treacherous, they're rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure. Is that true of our culture? I think we work at our play and we play at our work. We got it all backwards. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now here's a part that's really, really disheartening. They have a form of godliness. They go to church. They act very pious but they deny the power of it. It does not change their lives. This form of godliness on Sunday does not show up on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but they put it back on on Sunday. Having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. He then says, have nothing to do with them. I think that's like he said in Corinthians. Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Who you hang out with will determine who you will become. I say to young people, you always want to hang out with somebody who's one up on you. (laughs) You don't want to go one down. The one down will pull you down. The one up will pull you up. We say if they have the same principle, they won't want to hang around with me, probably. (laughs) But you you want to be with the person who's one up the one who knows the Lord, the one who prays, the one who who shares his faith. You want that one to pull you up. You don't want the one that's going to pull you down. It's needed more now than ever. Now, here's a few things that are associated with self-control. The person who has self-control has has these things also. Uh, We jump in the book of Acts, and several days later, uh, Felix sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about his faith in Jesus Christ. So Paul is talking about Jesus. And as, as he's discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. Righteousness. What is right? Well, how do we find out what's right? We go into the book, the Bible. The Bible tells us what is right. There is a, a standard. I display self-control in my life. Because one day, I'm going to give an account for my life of what I have done. And I'm going to be rewarded whether I have done good or evil, the Bible says. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Righteousness and judgment with self-control. So, what I've got an issue of, whatever it is, my my diet, uh, whether it is something to drink, or there's a hostile situation in my response with anger, I have to ask myself, what is right? Do the self-control only to display what is right. Because someday, God is going to judge me for the way I conducted my life in light of that thing in my life. So righteousness and judgment are associated with self-control. So our faith, love, and hope. He says in 1 Thessalonians, you are all sons of the light. If you know Jesus, you say, I was translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son, which is the kingdom of light. The day I accepted Jesus, light shone in my life. The day I accepted Jesus, I became a, a citizen of heaven and a child of the light. So he says, we do not belong to the night and darkness. I'm not that creepy, crawling bug of the night. I'm the butterfly of the day. My life has been transformed. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled. Self-controlled. 
putting on faith and love. See what's associated with self-control? Faith, love. When I'm out of control, I'm not displaying my faith in God. But in order to be self-controlled, I have to display my faith in God. This is putting them on faith and love as a breastplate. Now, I find it very interesting, Paul and the ladies are going to do this study on Ephesians, uh, on the armor of God, that the breastplate of righteousness is also here called a breastplate of faith and love. Because if you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ, it's because you believed in him and you're going to manifest the love of God in your life. You're going to be self-controlled. And he says, in the hope of salvation as a helmet, and and, and in Ephesians, you'll study in that study coming up, ladies, that I have the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. So it's all connected together. The third thing I want you to notice here is that self-control is a mental process. This is where it begins, folks. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. If you're dieting and you know that you're going to a party and they're going to be serving hors d'oeuvres, they're going to have a meal and they're going to have really rich desserts, you have to prepare your mind in advance that I'm just going to say no to the cake and ice cream, to the pie. You you have to do that. You prepare yourself in advance. He says, therefore, prepare your minds for action and be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace given to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. He goes on, he says, you need to clear your mind. Some of us have put a lot of garbage in our minds, and we need to get that stuff out. Wouldn't it be great if you could do like a control-alt-delete to your mind and just get rid of a lot of that negativity that's in there? He said, the end of all things is there. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-control. Get rid of the junk. Get rid of the junk. You need to alert your mind. Be self-controlled and be on alert. Listen, our adversary, that's what it says, your enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He knows your weakness. He's not going to attack you on your strength. He's going to find your weakness. So he says, be on the alert. Look out for the thing that's going to bring you down. You know it's going to happen. Don't set yourself up for failure. Be prepared. Be alert. You have to have a knowledgeable mind. You you need to know the Word of God. I love this passage in 2 Peter. Years ago, I memorized it in a different translation, so it's pretty hard to memorize it and spew it out now. But for this very reason, make every effort to add. Oh, you add to your faith. Here's what you add to your faith. People say, well, faith, isn't that just enough? No, he says, add to your faith goodness. Now, we talked about goodness as a fruit of the Spirit. Goodness is being like God because God is good. You act like God. He says, add to your faith acting like God, and to your goodness, he says, knowledge. you got to know God. That means you've got to get in the Word, and you're going to have to learn about God. You've got to know who He is. You've got to know how He acts and how He responds, what He wants for your life. And to your knowledge, he says, now add self-control. What you read in the Bible, then you do in your life. You put it into practice. You you control based upon what you know. And he says to your self-control, he says, add perseverance. That means, okay, I read in the Bible I'm supposed to tell the truth, and I just lied. Oh, I guess I should lie the rest of my life because I blew it. No. I go to the person, I apologize. I told you a falsehood as a lie. And you stop that behavior and you go and you try again. Okay, I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to tell the truth. And the same thing works for a diet. When you blow your diet, what do you do? You say, oh, I might as well eat everything that it's ever put before me because I blew my diet? No. I know some of you are saying, yeah. <laughs> well, what you do is you say, I got to go start all over. I have to persevere with this diet. I got to go back to the starting block and I got to be committed and I got to, that's what you do. To your knowledge, self-control, and that self-control, you persevere with it. And perseverance brings about godliness, and godliness brings about brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness brings about love. And I love this part. He says, if you possess these qualities, he just rattled off a whole list of them. 
If you possess these qualities in an increasing measure, you should be growing every day in your walk with Jesus. There should be more of this every day, every day, every day. You're becoming a stronger and more mature Christian. He says, they will keep you from being ineffective. You ever felt like I'm just getting nowhere? You ever felt like my life is just coming unraveled? You ever feel like nothing I'm doing is working? Maybe you better check the list. Because if you do these things, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. Now, if you want an effective life and you want a productive life, you've got to start working on these, and right at the heart of it is self-control. Self-control. It starts in your mind. The proverb put it this way. If you memorize any verse in the Bible, this is one you've got to have. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. The junk you're putting in your head on TV, that's what you become. That's why TV is different now than it was 50 years ago. Slowly let it creep in, it's become part of our mindset. We've got to take self-control and be responsible for what's in our minds. For as you think within your heart, what's dear to you? So is he. So is he. So how do you do it? How do you do this self-control thing? Well, you do it by walking in the Spirit. I say then, walk in the Spirit. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Uh, other translate, translate this just a little differently. He says, but I say, live by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the, sinful des- the, 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 the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature is contrary to the spirit and the spirit is contrary to the sinful nature they are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want when I live according to my flesh and do what I want to do rather than living in the spirit and what God says in his word I should do I'm in conflict with God I'm in conflict with God you see God is the one who is going to Work in you, self-control. So I got to get in step with God. I got to walk in the Spirit. So it says this, for it is God who works in you and to will and to act according to his good purpose. So I got to get close to God. He's the one that's working. You can only do it by his Spirit. I, 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 this whole series has been on that. The Holy Spirit has got to do this in you. In the book of Romans, he puts it this way. Those who live according to the sinful nature, remember I had the four chairs up here and the first one was the guy, he didn't have the Holy Spirit, his body was not the temple of the Holy Spirit, he didn't, he didn't know God. He says, those who live according to the sinful nature, that's the way he lives, he just lives horizontally. They have their mind set on what their nature desires, everything here on the earth, and they just let go. It's whatever you want to do. Whatever feels good, do it. He says, but... Those, and I had four chairs up. The last one was the the man who is the spiritual man. The man who lives according to the Spirit. They have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. See where the mind comes in? I focus on the Word of God and what it says, and I want to do the will of God. I focus on that. The mind of the sinful man, way over here, is death. That's where it leads. It leads to death every time. But the mind... Here it is, controlled by the Spirit. He's self-controlled. He's got the Holy Spirit prompting him. He's self-controlled. Lives by the Spirit. Is at peace and life. Listen, those controlled by the sinful nature over here just doing their own thing, they cannot please God. When I'm living like this, I claim to be a Christian, but I'm living like this, I can't please God. Cannot. It's an impossibility. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Listen, if you belong to Christ, you have the Spirit of Christ, and so you should be living like that, not like this. And when I start to walk with the Lord, based on his word, he will begin to manifest the fruit of the Spirit of self-control. The bottom line is you can have self-control over any area of your life. I don't care what it is. You could do it. You just got to get connected with the Spirit of God. Walk in the Spirit. 
and utilize the word, you can do it if you want to. See, so then it comes down to what do I really want? What do I really want? So how do I do it? I've been saying it over and over. You walk in the Spirit. You depend upon God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we all desire to have self-control. All of us for different reasons or in different areas. There's that area that just seems to dominate us. Where some we call it like our dark side. I don't know why I go there, but we do know. We walk according to the flesh and not according to the Spirit. Help us, Lord, to embrace the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Reading the Word, allowing the Word to be the knowledge base from which we act and persevere. And when we fall down, we get up and we go after it again so that in increasing measure, we grow in our faith and we become more and more effective and more and more productive for the glory of God. That is our prayer today, Lord that we would be a people manifesting all the fruit of the Spirit, but especially self-control. Help us, O God, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. After you had sung a hymn, they went out. May the Lord be with you and bless you. And uh, remember that today is a national day of prayer uh, for those who have been in Hurricane Harvey. Be in prayer for them. God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord.